Hello everyone, welcome back again to Biotechnica. So all of you welcome back again to Biotechnica NEET. So today we are going to do NEET question paper detail explanation about all the questions. So we have taken paper code which is going to be ES3. And today I'll be talking about zoology questions and later we'll be dealing with botany questions and also we'll come up with chemistry questions. And if you want to know uh, NEET at Biotechnica, you can join our Telegram channel. So you can find the link in the description box or you can find it in the screen also. So you can join the channel so that you get all the updates about NEET at Biotechnica. So let's proceed on to the questions. So the question paper was not that difficult. It was easy, but it was kind of trickier, we can say, because you have to look on to questions which talks about incorrect statements. So if you have observed it, the question paper is really going to be easy. Very specifically, if you have to talk about zoology questions, there is a lot of probability of getting good questions. And we also have a great opportunity of getting good marks also. So let's proceed on to the questions. So the first question, this is very important. The subject or the paper code is S3. And the first question, 151, which of the following statements are true for spermatogenesis, but do not hold true for oogenesis? So let's do this one. So we know what is spermatogenesis. Genesis means formation. So spermatogenesis means sperm formation or the production of sperms. And oogenesis means the production of egg or we can say ovum. Okay, the question is, which of the statement is true for spermatogenesis, but it is not true for oogenesis? That's the question. So let's see the first one. It results in the formation of haploid gametes. So haploid, we already know N set, which is half the number of chromosomes, 23 pairs. We can say, suppose if I have to talk about spermatogenesis. So in spermatogenesis, sperm is also going to be haploid. So this is also true. And if we talk about oogenesis, in oogenesis also ovum is going to be or ova is going to be haploid. So both are helpful in the formation of a haploid set. But they asked, true for only spermatogenesis, it should not be true for oogenesis. So we cannot choose this option. So we'll go for elimination method. So we cannot choose this option. The next one, differentiation of gamut occurs after the completion of meiosis. Okay, so suppose if I have to talk about spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis, the answer we already know, but let's discuss in detail. So in spermatogenesis, we know there's going to be a spermatogonia. So this cell is the one, gonium, we can say if it's singular. This cell will undergo meiosis. Meiosis one and two. And after that, we are going to get, at the end of meiosis 2, you will be getting four haploid sets. And we used to call this as spermatid. Spermatid, which do not have tails, which means they are non-functional. They are not functional ones. So we can say differentiation means functional. So what the option actually says is differentiation of gamut, which means this is the gamut that I've got four gametes, four haploid gametes we have got. So they are non-functional. So they just differentiate in order to become functional one. And now we call them as what? Sperms. Now we call them as sperms. And this process is called as spermiogenesis. When a non-functional sperm getting converted into a functional sperm, we used to call it spermiogenesis. This usually happens only in the sperm formation. And this kind of differentiation you will not see in ovum. So this is only true for spermatogenesis and it is not true for oogenesis. So we have come to a conclusion. This statement is actually correct. So where are you seeing the option? You can see the option in 1, 2 and 4. So we can eliminate option number three. Okay, the next one, meiosis occurs continuously in a mitotic dividing stem cells. This happens very specifically in spermatogenesis only. You will never see the meiosis will happen continuously in case of females. 
So this is applicable only for spermatogenesis or to be very specific, it is true for spermatogenesis, but it is not true for oogenesis. The next one, it is controlled by luteinizing hormone and FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone secreted by the anterior part of the pituitary. If you observe, a sperm production also requires LH and it also requires FSH. The same applies for oogenesis. For formation of egg, you want LH also, FSH also, which is true for both the cases. But the question is only it has to be true for spermatogenesis. So we cannot choose this option. The next option, it is initiated at puberty. Yes, after a stage only, the sperm production will actually happen after 14, 15 to 16 years. Then only the sperm production actually happens. But if you observe, in case of females, we already know the primary oocytes will be produced even during the embryonal development and later only it just forms what ovum we can say or we can say very specifically secondary oocyte the secondary oocyte will fuse with sperm to form the zygote we already know that time it forms as an egg we know so this is applicable only for sperm production it is not applicable for oogenesis so these statement and this statement and this statement goes correct so the answer for this question is very simple. It's option two. The next one, you can see. Question number 152, given below are two statements. So in the about two statement, we have to choose the most appropriate statement from the option that is given below. Questions are very important. So statement one says that fatty acids and glycerol cannot be absorbed in the blood. We know. Suppose if I have to talk about lipids, let me just. Suppose if I have to talk about lipids, lipids are made up of fatty acids and glycerol. So fatty acids are going to be R, COOH, it can be any saturated or unsaturated. And glycerol, we already know. There's going to be alcohol group. And this is going to be glycerol. So this can bind with any one of the hydroxyl group which is actually present. So this is lipid. Fatty acids and glycerol are insoluble in water. Insoluble in water. If they are insoluble in water, they cannot be transported in the blood. Because blood used to contain maximum amount of water. So they are not absorbed by the blood. This statement is actually correct. Let's check in for the next statement. Specialized lymphatic capillaries called lacteals are only able to carry chylomicrons into the lymphatic vessels and ultimately into the blood. Let's understand this. Suppose there's going to be fatty acids and glycerols. They are going to be hydrophobic molecule. Hydrophobic or we can say they are going to be lipid soluble molecule or water insoluble molecule so this molecule cannot go as such so what exactly happened is they used to form a small drop like like structures and we used to call it as missiles even this missiles now will be transported to the intestine okay it will be going to the intestine intestine usually has four layers in that it used to go to the mucosa layer let's consider this is the small intestine and this missiles actually goes into this area and now it has to be absorbed. Now it just changes into something called as chylomicron. Chylomicrons are nothing but inside you have fatty acids and glycerols, which are going to be fats and surrounded they will have proteins. So these proteins will be water soluble in nature. So if they are water soluble in nature, they can be transported in the blood. But who is going to carry this one? There are some capillaries, very tiny capillaries, which carries them and gives it to vessels, which is going to be lymphatic vessels. And then the blood is going to absorb this complete chylomicron, which is going to have fatty acids and glycerol, we can say. This protein is just dissociate and fatty acids and glycerol will be reabsorbed by the blood, we can say. So both the statements are actually correct, but let's check in for it. Both the statement 1 and 2 are correct, yes, because they are insoluble in water. So they cannot be absorbed by the blood. So what they will form? So fatty acids and glycerol first forms a missile. And where does this missile goes? It's like a round part. 
which is actually carrying this and it will move into intestinal mucosa small intestine mucosa area which is the out uh, innermost layer we can say and then it is again getting changed into a small protein coated so proteins will be coated out so this is going to be the protein and then they have the fats inside it so i'm telling directly a fatty acids and glycerol as fats and now this structure is called as chylomicron and this chylomicron will go into let's consider this is the lymphatic vessel this is the lymphatic vessel and this will actually goes here and let's consider this is the blood capillaries this is lymphatic capillaries which actually brings and this is blood vessels and inside the blood vessels they are going to have blood so from here it will go to the this area and here it will be absorbed so both the statements are correct so what is going to be the answer we can say both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct so the correct answer for this question is option c or we can say third one the next one breeding crops okay so if you want to grow a crop with high levels of vitamins golden rice is a great example which is enriched with vitamin a and minerals some has higher protein and we can also induce some fats also to it healthier fats and what is that process called as so we can say vitamin a is is actually introduced into rice and we used to call it golden rice this golden rice this or we can say the process of increasing the amount of any kind of vitamins or minerals in a plant to improve the breed and increasing the quantity and the quality what is that process called as that is called as bio fortification so the answer is very simple it is bio fortification what about accumulation accumulation means something is going to deposit so if any substances is going to accumulate like we can say there is a gradual accumulation of some pesticides or some chemicals in an organism we used to call it bio accumulation bio magnification if you're going to talk about magnification means there's an increase in the concentration of toxic substances it can be in any ecosystem we can say so that is bio magnification bio remediation is means usually we used to use some microorganism and we used to treat the polluted water all this thing that is bio remediation there there where the superbugs actually comes so the answer for this question is very simple it's bio fortification the rest of the option doesn't apply to this question the next question is 154 if an e coli strain listen carefully i gene which means they are talking about inhibitor gene it's not inducer gene it is inhibitor gene is getting mutated and its product cannot bind to the inducer molecule if growth medium is provided with a lactose what will be the outcome first let's understand what is the inducer the inducer is going to be lactose okay let's make two situation and we'll understand when a lactose is present what will happen when a lactose is not present what will happen so let's take there is going to be a gene in a e coli very specifically i'm growing an e coli i'm growing an e coli in a medium inside that an e coli is grown so here there's one e coli there's an e coli now in the medium i am providing glucose so glucose is a monosaccharide which means a simple sugar so uh, e coli can take this uh, glucose very easily but suppose there's another situation i'm growing the e coli i'm just placing all the e coli here this is e coli but i'm not giving glucose for the e coli to grow instead i'm giving lactose but e coli cannot utilize lactose as such because lactose is a disaccharide which means they are made up of glucose and fructose so in order to utilize lactose they have to break the lactose there comes the action of lactoferrin then there are some genes which are involved in breaking this lactose which are going to be gene z gene y and gene a if this is not activated they cannot break a lactose then this e coli if it's not able to break a lactose they won't get energy and they ultimately die so what we are going to do in this reaction is first let's understand the genes which is present inside the e coli let's take this is the complete e coli 
and we are telling this is going to be the nucleus in the nucleus there is a gene present or we can say dna is present there is going to be promoter i gene and then a promoter very specifically and operator z gene y gene and a a gene remember this gene they are talking about listen carefully this i gene is called as inhibitor gene or we can call it repressor gene which actually produces some protein repressor gene now what exactly happened listen carefully this inhibitor gene will undergo transcription to produce inhibitor mrna and they produces a protein by undergoing translation to form what inhibitor or we can say repressor and listen carefully whenever a repressor is present let's consider some color so this is going to be the repressor and whenever a repressor is formed what exactly happens is this repressor has a greater affinity towards this area this area is called operator which is like a switch which can keep it on and off so there is going to be a repressor which will go and bind always to the operator okay now what exactly happened p is referring to promoter so this is a promoter i is a inhibitor gene i gene this is lac z lac y and lac k and lac z usually helps to produce some enzyme because this is a gene a gene will undergo transcription to produce mrna and then a protein which is going to be beta gal and this beta gal is the one which breaks lactose into glucose and fructose so now what exactly is going to happen is if there is a blockage here okay now what exactly happen they cannot move which cannot move rna polymerase rna polymerase usually comes and binds to the promoter and as they move now the inhibitor gene is going to produce inhibitor protein and now this rna polymerase moves to this promoter region but after this they cannot move because there is a blockage this repressor has gone bound there so if this rna polymerase is not able to move you cannot produce beta gal you cannot produce a uh, y usually codes for permease enzyme you cannot produce trans acetylase enzyme if any of these enzyme is not produced you cannot break a lactose usually this situation happens when there is no lactose if there is no need to break lactose this is the situation now the question says if a lactose is present let's talk about if lactose is present operator z y and a if repressor i gene is there it is producing a repressor protein directly i'm writing an rna polymerase comes and bind here it moves an rna polymerase comes and bind here and now they are telling there is an inducer and now this inducer is going to be lactose suppose i'm giving lactose in the medium and this lactose usually just isomerizes into allolactose so i'm considering this is allolactose and this is going to be a repressor so usually repressor has a greater affinity towards op operator but now this repressor has greater affinity towards this two now they both will combine together and now this area is free as this area is free this promoter just slides over and then as it comes this promoter comes here beta gal is synthesized mrna here also mrna for this and here also the mrna is actually synthesized so all their mrna are synthesized as they are synthesized what will happen beta gal and then there's going to be permease enzyme enzymes of proteins and then trans acetylase is produced now all of these things can break lactose but now our question says this i gene is mutated listen carefully i gene is mutated which means the promoter inhibitor promoter operator z y a is there they are telling this is mutated if this is mutated there is a probability we might not get a repressor also no repressor let's consider that there is no repressor that's what they're telling in an e coli i gene gets mutated and its product cannot bind to the inducer listen carefully what is that inducer lactose so now they're telling i am going to grow this e coli in a lactose medium now this lactose is going to be an inducer now lactose is present usually when a lactose is present they both can bind with each other 
if the glucose growth medium is given with lactose what is going to happen this and represser is not able to produce so it will not be able to bind to this lactose now what's going to happen you will think that there is going to be translation and transcription will happen but no there is no translation and transcription will happen here even though when a lactose is present so the answer for this question is going to be z y a gene will never be translated so the answer for this question is going to be option a the next question which of the following is present between adjacent bones of the vertebral column we already know about the vertebral column let's consider there's a vertebral column here and there's a vertebral column here if two vertebral columns are going to bind together there's pre synapses and post synapses so if both of them are going to be bound together without any agent in between them they both will get or we can say they just get degraded so there there has to be something which actually present in between these two bones which of these is actually present is going to be the question let's understand what is it going to be which of the following is actually present between these two is it areolar tissues no areolar tissue is going to be a loose connective tissue usually you will see this areolar tissues under your skin so this is actually not present between the vertebral column so you cannot choose this option smooth muscles smooth muscles you will actually see in all the visceral organs visceral organs like stomach intestine or we can say pancreas all this area you will see smooth muscles so this is also not present in the vertebral column so adjacent bones intercalated disc listen carefully there's a difference between intervertebral disc and intercalated disc intercalated disc you will see in cardiac muscle not in vertebral column if suppose if the question is given intervertebral disc then we might have marked the answer yes but here they have given intercalated suppose let me draw a cardiac heart tissue you will see some intercalated disc like this so this is called as intercalated in case of hearts you will see so this is also not the correct answer but if you're going to see cartilage yes in between these things there are some flexible cartilages which are made up of chondrocytes okay cartilage so this cartilage is actually present between these two adjacent bones of the vertebral column and this disc is called as intervertebral disc so in order to confuse us they have given intercalated disc but the answer is intervertebral disc which are actually made up of cartilages so the answer for this question is very simple cartilage okay given below are two statements autoimmune disorder is a condition where body defense mechanism recognizes its own cells as foreign body and the next one is rheumatoid arthritis is a condition where body does not attack self in the light of the above statement choose the most appropriate answer from the option which is given below okay let's understand what is autoimmune disorder autoimmune disorder mean auto is self it is a condition where body defense mechanism recognize its own cell as foreign body is it a correct statement yes listen suppose let me consider rheumatoid arthritis or whatever it is so what exactly happens is the body considers our own self as a foreign one so it thinks like it is a foreign body like antigen and it kills themselves so this statement is actually correct let's check rheumatoid arthritis is a condition where body does not at attack cell cells no rheumatoid arthritis is an example for autoimmune disease which means it considers the body cell as themselves but they consider it as what antigen so this is a wrong statement so we can say the statement 1 is correct but the statement 2 is actually wrong so the correct answer for this question is 1 the next question so you can see here option 1 is correct so first statement is correct the second statement is actually wrong okay at which stage of the oogenesis process is initiated okay i already told you spermatogenesis usually takes place at puberty if you're talking about in boys so the sperm production actually takes place after puberty or at the time of puberty but in case of females if we have to talk about females or when they are in the embryo stage 
in their embryo stage when you're going to go and check in for their ovary that time itself there are some follicles present even in the embryonal stage the oogenesis is actually initiated so it is not after puberty it is actually during embryonal developmental itself so the answer for this question is embryonic development let's understand this so the option 4 is correct yes so even during the embryonal development you can see there are many oogonia which are present in the fetal mother cell this is a line from ncert at the puberty you will have 60000 to 80000 primary follicle usually there will be oogonia so this oogonia you will see in the embryo stage there are lot of oogonium so we calling it oogonia and this oogonia only will undergo meiosis and when you are going to check at the time of puberty if you are going to check the ovary of that girl you will be having 60000 to 80000 primary follicles and later you can see rest degenerate during the phase from birth to puberty there will be some degeneration which will be happening initially it will be like millions later it will be degenerated so the answer is very simple the next question 158 select this is very important incorrect statement with reference to mitosis mitosis means threads it happens in it usually happens in somatic cells which means they are not sex cells which are apart from these cells okay so we are going to select the incorrect statement chromosomes decondens at telophase is it correct usually understand this concept there is going to be thread like structures and this thread like structures are called as chromatin fibers okay when a chromatin fibers undergoes condensation we used to call them as chromosomes we used to call them as chromosomes so condensation when you have a condensation then this small ones will get converted into a chromosome like this structure the first option states that the chromosome decondenses which means it is going back again from the chromosomal to chromatid like this like this structure it just changes this is decondensation when does this process will happen if we have to talk about prophase metaphase anaphase and telophase so in prophase what will happen suppose this is going to be the cell they will have suppose let's consider two chromatin fibers are present in this phase what exactly happen in metaphase there would be chromosomes will be arranged in the equatorial plane which means they have condensed they are all arranged in the equatorial plane in anaphase what will happen the chromatids will separate this is chromatid the single ones are called chromatid this is chromatid not chromatin it is chromatid so here they actually separates like this in the anaphase in telophase what will happen they just decondense like this like this they just decondense like this that is why it is called decondensation in telophase so the first option is correct but they asked for incorrect statement so we cannot choose this option okay the splitting of centromeres occurs at the anaphase yes so you can see here there is a centromere the central part is called centromere and the centromere actually splits half here and half here this is actually taking place in the anaphase yes this is also a correct statement but they asked for incorrect statement so you cannot choose this option all the chromosomes line at the equator here in m phase here one chromosome all of them are in equatorial position so this is also a correct statement but they asked for incorrect so you cannot choose this listen carefully the next statement is very important spindle fibers attaches to centromere of chromosomes very important listen carefully suppose this is going to be the spindle fibers let's understand this this is the spindle fiber this is the spindle fibers so what exactly happened this is the spindle fiber the spindle fibers are actually not attached this is the centromere central one okay the spindle fibers are not attached to the centromere there is a disc shaped structure which is actually present around them and that is called kinetochores so the spindle fibers are not directly attached to the centromere but they are attached to this kinetochore but in our options they have given spindle fibers 
attaches to centromere of chromosomes which is wrong it's not attached to centromere it is actually attached to kinetochore so the incorrect statement is going to be which one option number 4 okay let's look for the next one in situ conservation in situ means on site okay suppose if you are talking about any elephant or if you are talking about any animals or plants or whatever it is if they if we believe that animal is going to become endangered it is about to become uh, damaged or extinct then what exactly they'll do they'll preserve them in the same area where they are actually living suppose they are living in a forest we protect those animals in the same natural habitat itself that is going to be in situ now the question is in situ conservation refers to conserving only endangered species which means the species which will die very quickly and there won't be any more like that if you are believing that they are going to become endangered are you going to conserve only them or you're going to conserve extinct species species which has already gone okay are you going to conserve that or you're going to conserve only high risk species which are about to become damaged or would become extinct you're going to protect that but an in situ what we will do is anything it can be endangered it can be extinct species it can be high risk species vulnerable species whatever it is you're going to protect those animals or plants in the same locality so we can say the answer is very simple protecting and conserving the entire whole ecosystem is the correct answer for this question so the correct answer is very simple it's option 3 The next question: Which of the following function is not performed by secretions from salivary gland? Yes, we know we have salivary gland in our buccal cavity. Glands are usually made up of cells, so we can say salivary gland is actually made up of many cells. Cells, and these cells are usually going to be secretory in nature, which are going to secrete something. and what are they going to secrete they are going to secrete some enzymes like salivary amylases and of course the saliva they usually secrete saliva and in the saliva you will find salivary amylases and water and many more so they are going to be present over here yes now the question is which is not performed by the secretions from salivary gland lubrication of oral cavity yes i told you usually a salivary gland secretes saliva which contains water which is mainly responsible for lubrication purposes so that's a correct statement but they asked for incorrect one so we cannot choose this option the next one digestion of disaccharid understand carefully they are talking about disaccharid disaccharid means it can be sucrose lactose and maltose If you see in INCERT book, this sucrose, lactose, and maltose breakdown will be listed in the small intestine, not in the buccal cavity, not in the mouth. It the breaking down of a disaccharide will always takes place in the small intestine region. Suppose if you are going to talk about polysaccharide, if you are taking roti or chapati or rice, so you used to consume in the form of starch. So usually thirty percentage of your starch. is getting broken down in the buccal cavity itself with the help of salivary gland which secretes saliva with the help of salivary amylases with the help of salivary amyl so they didn't talk about a polysaccharide but listen carefully the last option says the digestion of complex carbohydrate which means they are talking about starch here Yes, so thirty percentage of the starch is actually digested in the mouth only. The remaining seventy percentage will happen only in the small intestine. So the wrong statement is digestion of disaccharide will not take place in the mouth. It will take place only in the small intestine. Control bacterial population in the mouth. Yes, is it going to saliva is going to have only salivary amylase water? No, they're going to have very important enzyme which we call it lysozymes. so salivary gland is going to secrete saliva and this saliva is going to have lysozyme and they're going to have water this water is mainly responsible for lubrication purposes and lysozyme if you're eating anything toxic or let's consider some uh, food which contains bacteria so this lysozyme actually protects and fight against bacterial infections in your mouth itself 
So ba controls bacterial population in the mouth. Yes, this is a correct statement. But they ask you for which is not performed by them. So the answer for this question is very simple. It's option two. Okay, the next one. Given below, they have given two statements. One is labeled as assertion. Another one is labeled as reason. Okay, the first one, osteo. Porosis, we have done this question also, is characterized by decreased bone mass and increased chance of fracture. Listen, osteo is referring to bones, correct? Yes. And porosis, porosis means there is going to be some kind of degradations or there is going to be decreased bone mass in the bone is going to happen. But listen, so osteoporosis is characterized by decreased bone mass definitely osteoblast osteoclast all the cells will become less and if all of them are becoming less people used to have fractures women who have uh, reached very old stage after menopause usually suffer from this problem called osteoporosis but what is the reason this osteoporosis is actually happening if you have observed i told you women who have menopause which means when the bleeding stops at a certain age, what will happen? There is a decrease of estrogen level. If estrogen level is less, ultimately it causes decreased bone mass. But the question or the statement here they have given increased level. So this is a wrong statement. So you cannot choose this. So assertion first one is correct and the second one is wrong. So the answer for this question is A is correct. But the reason is not the correct one. So option one is going to be the correct one. The next one, given below are two statements. The coagulum is formed network of threads called thrombins. Okay. The second statement, spleen is the graveyard of erythrocytes. Yes, spleen is also going to be the one which forms RBC. And they are the one which also allows the death of RBC. That's why we are calling it. They are the blood bank also. They are the graveyard also. So this we have already done. So this is a correct statement. Let's understand. So statement two is correct. Statement two correct. You are seeing only in third option and the second option. So you can reject these two options. Okay. What about statement one? Listen carefully. Usually when there is going to be any kind of clotting, if anybody is bleeding, the blood bleeding has to stop. So what exactly happened? Prothrombin will be converted into thrombin script. And with the help of an enzyme called thrombokinesis. Very important. And this thrombin is now activated. And this thrombin is going to convert in, in sol or we can say fibrinogen. Fibrinogen into fibrin. And this fibrin usually will be soluble in nature. Okay. And if they are soluble, they cannot make thread-like structures. So they will become insoluble fibrins. But listen carefully, they are telling this coagulation is actually because of the thread called thrombin. No, this thread-like structure is called fibrins. It's not called thrombins. Thrombin is just activating fibrinogen into fibrin. The thread is going to be fibrins only, but they have given thrombin. So this is a wrong statement. But this statement is a correct statement. So we can say statement one is incorrect, but the statement two is correct. So here they have given, so you have to reject this option and go in for the correct option, which is option two. Okay. The next one given below are two statements again. Mycoplasma can pass through less than one micron filter size, which means they are the most smallest cell we can say. It's a unicellular organism, which is very small. So it will be like 0 0.3 micrometer, very less size. So it can pass through it. Listen carefully. Mycoplasma are bacteria. Listen, this is the word. It is with cell wall they have given. Mycoplasma is a bacteria, but without cell wall. So this, this same pattern of question has repeated two times in the question paper, which is very easy. If you have understood, it would be very easy. So the first statement is correct, but the second statement is actually wrong. So where are we saying statement one is correct, but the statement two is wrong. So you're going to see in first option. So the correct answer for this question is option one. Okay. So you can see same thing, whatever we have seen over here. Okay. Tegmina. Tegmina means they're talking about four wings. 
it's not hind wings four wings if you're going to talk about the cockroach this four wing arises from which part is it from prothorax mesothorax or metathorax that's the question so is it arising very simple question if you remember this one it's going to be easy cockroach usually gets in your neat examination so one such question is going to be this four wings arises from which one of these things the answer is simple it's mesothorax which is option fourth one but let's see so you can see they are talking about four wings the four wing is actually coming here so which means they are actually arising from mesothorax region only they are not talking about hind wings they are talking about the four wings which is tegmina which actually arises from the mesothorax part this bottommost portion it actually arise not exactly in the prothorax so answer is very simple it's option 4 next question given below are two statement one is labeled assertion another one is a reasoning question this question we have already done uh, in the previous things so all vertebrates or chordates but all chordates are not vertebrates that's a assertion the reason is notochord is replaced by vertebral column in the adult vertebrates let's check let's understand this and then we'll come back to it listen carefully the answer is c only but let's understand it listen so i'm going to make three divisions so we know about chordata chordata so the chordata is actually divided into subphylum subphylum okay and the sub phylums are actually divided into three one is called as euro chordata and the other one is going to be cephalo chordata cephalo chordata another one is going to be vertebrata vertebrata see chordata means there is going to be notochords present notochord present notochord present and listen carefully in this case this uro means uro is always related with tail or the bottommost portion so if the notochord is present in the tail then we call that organism as uro chordata cephalo means head so if the notochord is present from the head from head to tail then they are cephalochordata in vertebrata if you have to talk about if the notochord is replaced by vertebral column so the notochord just changes into a vertebral column those organisms are called as vertebrata listen carefully so now i can say all the vertebrates are chordates because they are coming under chordata all vertebrates are chordates correct but not all the chordates are going to be vertebrata because these two are not vertebrates they are non vertebrate they are non vertebrata or invertebrata so we can say all vertebrata are going to be chordate but not all the chordates are going to be vertebrate so the first statement is actually correct yes and the notochord is replaced by vertebral column in the adult yes this is also correct so we can say option third one because a and r is also correct that you are seeing in third option and fourth option and the real reason is based on the notochord whether a notochord is replaced into a vertebral vertebral column or not so the correct answer for this question is going to be option 3 okay the next question nitrogenous waste is excreted in the form of pellet listen carefully nitrogenous waste can be any forms so they can be in the form of ammonia they can be in the form of urea they can be in the form of urea or they can be in the form of uric acids so the organism which excrete ammonia are called ammonotelic organism the organism which excrete urea are called as ureotelic organisms or animals this is a question from excretory chapter uric acid animals which excrete uric acids are called as uricotelic organism very important easy question ammonia is very toxic very toxic and when you compare urea urea is kind of less toxic kind of less than ammonia 
and then the uric acids. So you always see an organism if they are living in water, any organism which lives in water, they excrete most of the organism, but there are exceptional cases, excrete ammonia. Why they excrete ammonia? Because they have water. So ammonia will always be excreted when there is an abundance of water. So those organisms which actually lives in wa water are going to be ammonotelic organism. And we all come under urea. We usually excrete urea. We have moderate water. We don't live in um, aquatic situation. We live in a land situation where we consume water also. But if you observe birds, birds us usually travels above, which means they get very limited water. And insects, insects. Because it is less toxic, so they don't need that much amount of water. So here the water concentration is less. If water concentration is less, then the excreta will be in the form of paste or pellet. Okay, so the answer is going to be any birds it can be or we can say it can be any insects. Let's check for this. Hippocampus, pavo and ornithorhynchus and salamander. Listen carefully. Pavo is going to be a bird. So uh, pellet or paste formation or we can say uric acid is actually excreted by any bird or it can be insect. So the correct answer is pavo, which is nothing but peacock or turkey. All this come under this pavo. What is hippocampus? Hippocampus usually you will see in aquatic conditions, which means they used to be uh, excreting ammonia only. Okay. And ornithophus, which is a platypus, platypus, we'll see that also, which is a mammal actually. Salamander, I'm going to show you the images of all this thing. Salamander is going to be, it looks like reptiles, but it's not reptile, it is actually amphibian. It is an amphibian, but it looks like reptile. You should not include a salamander under reptile. So the correct answer for this question is going to be pavo. You can see this image. So this is going to be hippocampus campus and this is going to be platypus platypus or we can say it's going to be ornithorhynchus this is pavo family subgenus family pavo or we can say uh, turkey also come under this this is salamander this is salamander this salamander looks like a lizard kind of thing which is not a reptile it is an amphibians so let's check listen so we know the answer is pavo only, but listen carefully. We can say bony fishes like hippocampus. So hippocampus is a bony fish, which means they are osteochitis, osteochitis, which means they are living in water. If they are living in water, they can excrete even ammonia. Say they are ammonotelic organism, they excrete ammonia. But the question for us is in the form of pellet. Pellet usually uric acid only. Okay, that this will not do. If we have to talk about platypus, it usually excrete urea. So they are ureotelic animal. But birds like pavo used to excrete uric acids in the form of pellet. And salamander, if you have to talk about salamander, they are amphibians. They live in water also. They live in land also. Usually they will excrete ammonia. So they are ammonotelic animals. Got it? Yes. The next one, a dehydration. This is a point to be noted in your examination. A dehydration reaction links two glucose molecule to produce maltose, which means they are talking about maltose, which is a disaccharide. If the formula for glucose is C6, H12, O6, then what is the formula for maltose? That's a question. Easy question from biomolecule. Listen. C6H12O6 is glucose. And we know there is glucose and glucose. Very specifically, both are going to be alpha D glucose, alpha D glucose. Okay. This is also going to be C6H12O6. So we will think the answer has to be you have to add C12H24O12. But this is not the correct answer. Listen carefully. They have given very specifically here dehydration. You have to remove water molecule. Whenever in biology or in biomolecules, in biological system, wherever you remove water molecule, a bond is formed. So here you have to minus H2O. So the answer is C12 
H22, you have to minus two hydrogens and oxygen, one oxygen. So C12, H22, O11. So the answer is first one C12, H22 and O11. This is the wrong statement. C, uh, C12, H24, they have given to confuse you. Here also they have given 24. This is all wrong options. So the correct answer is option one. Good. The next one regarding meiosis, which of the statement is important, incorrect. This is what you have to observe. Pairing of homologous chromosomes and recombination occurs in meiosis one. Yes, it is correct because we used to study leptotene, pactetine, zygotene phases, very important phases. So suppose if you're talking in case of meiosis one, this is one chromosome and this is one chromosome, chromosome number one, chromosome number two. And the crossing over usually happens between them. Very specifically in zygotene, it actually comes in by and the crossing over actually happens in the next phases, in the forthcoming phases. Let's not go in for detail. So this is going to be meiosis one, correct? Yes, it is correct. So the first statement is correct, but they ask you to select the incorrect statement. So we'll not take this. Four haploid cells are formed at the end of meiosis one. Yes, let's check in. Suppose Shivaji. Hello, Shivaji. Yes, listen. So suppose if I have to talk about one cell, so the one cell is going to divide into diploid cell N and N. This is meiosis one. And again, this is going to split into N, N and N and N. This is happening in meiosis two. Yes which means here it is equational division. Here it is a reduction, 2n to n. This is a reduction division. So the four, second option is four haploid cells. Yes, you're getting one over here, one over here, one over here, and one over here, are formed at the end of meiosis two, correct? Yes, this is a correct statement, but they asked for incorrect one. Then reject this option. There are two stages. Yes, meiosis one and meiosis two, yes. So you cannot choose this option because they asked for incorrect statement. Let's check. DNA replication occurs in yes phase of meiosis 2. Understand it carefully. Very easy question. See, if you're talking about a cell cycle, there is going to be interfaces, which is going to be G1 phase, yes phase, G2 phase, and it can be meiosis phase. Let me understand it's meiosis 1. Okay, it's meiosis 1. So there is going to be 1B1 S phase. 1B1 S phase, but it is actually before meiosis one, but they have given it occurs in S phase of meiosis two. Then the question is, ma'am, there's gonna be one cell, which is two N. And during meiosis one, they have given one haploid set here and one haploid set here. But in meiosis two, two haploid set and here two haploids, so four haploid set. Then what happened in this phase? There is no uh, phase like after meiosis, there is no G1, G2 or we can say S and G2. That phase is called as interkinesis phase for some period of time, but there is no duplication of DNA. So this is the wrong statement. We have to select which is the incorrect statement. So fourth option number four is the incorrect statement that they have asked in this question. Next one, 169. Under normal, normal physiological conditions in case of a human being, very easy question. This we have already done. Every 100 molecule of oxygenated blood can deliver how much ml of oxygen to the tissue? Listen carefully. If you're talking about blood, so from the heart, after all the reaction, you're going to have the oxygenated blood, which actually comes through the aorta. And this blood has to reach every cell in your body. It has to reach every cell, every tissue, every organ in your body. But they are telling 100 ml of blood is actually coming. But how much amount of oxygen, how much amount of or ml of oxygen is going to go for the tissues? How much amount? 5 ml. This is a calculation. This is a direct question which is actually from your NCRT book. You can see it over here. See? So... Or every 100 ml of, this is a question from breathing and exchange of gases, 100 ml of blood delivers 50 ml of oxygen to the tissue. But you might not be confused with the 4 ml because 4 ml is deoxygenated blood. The deoxygenated blood will be carried to the lungs, correct? 
and in the lungs alveoli there is going to be exchanges so how much amount of the deoxygenated blood goes through the alveoli means it's 4m 4ml 100 ml of deoxygenated blood gives 4 ml of uh, deoxygenated condition to the lungs that is given here every 100 ml of blood delivers 4 ml of carbon dioxide but here they are talking about oxygen so the answer for this question is very simple it's option no not option 2 it's option 4 which is going to be fourth one 5 ml okay let's do the next question given below are two statements the relief of sperms into the seminiferous tubules is called spermiation and the second one spermiogenesis is the process of formation of sperms from spermatogonia okay we have to find out what is the correct statement and we have to select the incorrect statement let's check the release of sperms into the seminiferous tubules yes let's we already know the sperm is actually formed but the sperm used to go in the pathway and it reaches the seminiferous tubules and the conduction or the transport or the release of sperm which actually binds to the sertoli cells and then only they get activated when they are moving what is this process called as this process is correct spermiation the movement or the release of sperms from the cells and then they are being conducted in the seminiferous tubule is called spermiation correct the next one spermiogenesis is the process of formation of sperms from spermatogonia let's understand this this spermatogonia sperm spermatogonium i'm writing because i'm writing only one cell and this cell is going to undergo meiosis to produce first it will undergo meiosis 1 and produces two cells later these two cells will undergo meiosis 2 to produce four haploid cells correct these are all haploid and i told you these are all non functional ones this is called spermatid and this spermatid will be converted into sperms which are which will become activated this process is called the conversion of a non functional spermatid into a sperm is called as spermiogenesis but the production of if you're going to produce a sperm this complete process is called spermatogenesis in the second option they have given spermiogenesis spermiogenesis means from a spermatid to a sperm only which mean a non functional to functional the complete process has to be spermatogenesis so they should have given here spermatogenesis but they have given spermiogenesis so spermatogenesis is the process of formation of sperms from spermatogonia so the first statement is correct but the second statement is wrong so the statement 1 is correct and the statement 2 is wrong so the correct answer for this question is option one okay so we have done uh, some of the questions which is given in our examination the rest of the questions will be dealing in the upcoming classes so all of you do join back again and for your information if you want to know more about biotechnica uh, or the neat at biotechnica you can join our telegram channel which is going to be really helpful and i'm going to meet you back again in the next classes and take care all of you and we'll meet meeting back again thank you thank you so much